This is to talk about representations of the break group and uh, topological quantum computing. Uh, the picture you're looking at is, uh, is an illustration from a Scientific American article that was published a few years ago and illustrates some of the themes of the talk. What you see is uh, a person um, manipulating a braid and the braid ends are attached to uh, what look like um, uh, vortices uh, in a, in a two-dimensional fluid and those could represent uh, the vortices in the quantum Hall effect and, uh, and they, when they move around one another, could uh, have phase changes occur and reflect the braiding and, uh, and the picture illustrates a hope that one might be able to manipulate such things and create controlled computations. So that's, uh, that picture contains a lot of ideas. Uh, this talk is joint work with Sam LaMonaco, and um, this is his trademark image that he often uses in his slideshow, so the quantum dog, so I thought I would include it here. Um, and this dog is a very scholarly one, as you see. Um, as I said, the uh, original motivation here, which is still ongoing research for many people, is to use topological structures in the physical realization of quantum computing systems. The idea being that if you if you do something that gives rise to topological situations, then they're subject to perturbation without changing their essential structure. Um, and the hope is that a physical system such as quantum Hall fluid having topological features would be resistant to that perturbation and so give rise to reliable and scalable computing. Those quantum Hall systems are attracted, attractive. They're they're related to conformal field theory and Chern Simon's Witten theory on the physical side, and to fundamental low dimensional topology, combinatorial topology, which is the only kind of thing uh, topology that I'm going to be talking about today. I won't worry about Chern Simon's theory today. Uh, the gates that would make the computer would be constructed by a braiding of collective electronic excitations in two-dimensional media in this image uh, or vision. And the investigation of the topology leads to rich unitary representations of the art and braid group, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, these representations of the braid group can generate all the unitary transformations that are needed for computing. And it's quite interesting to contemplate between the braid group and other structures that are outside of topology, braids being, after all, generalizations of the symmetric group, and the symmetric group is understood to be fundamental to anything involving. Um, so these same representations give us algorithms for computing the Jones polynomial and colored Jones polynomial and the witten rashtikhin derived invariance of three manifolds. So they're quite interesting representations. That, But we have to study a little quantum mechanics first. And um, this image shows you a bit of quantum mechanics. It has Schrodinger's equation on it and some, and some cloud chamber pictures and the uncertainty principle. A Feynman diagram over there on the lower right. Um, I also am including uh, a quantum cat along with the quantum dog. Um, this cat uh, is not Schrodinger's cat. This, uh, or maybe it is, maybe this cat belonged to Schrodinger. In any case, this cat is contemplating Schrodinger's equation, as you can see. So here is quantum mechanics in a nutshell, the outline of the theory. The state of a physical system corresponds to a unit length vector in a complex vector space. This vector space is often infinite dimensional. It was in the first kind of formulations of quantum theory. But if there are only a finite number of things that you intend to observe, the finite number of possibilities, then it can be a finite dimensional vector space. And uh, a physical process is modeled by a unitary transformation applied to the state vector. 
A unitary transformation is a complex orthogonal transformation. It preserves lengths. And if you had a vector, and I'm using Dirac notation, which you may or may not be familiar with, Dirac notation uses a vertical bar and a right bracket and encloses inside that bracket a label. It can be any label at all. Um, it just is whatever you're labeling the vector with. And, um, and the covector is written in the opposite way with the bracket going in the other direction and the bar on the right. And a covector applied to a vector is, corresponds to evaluation or inner product. Here I have written in um, what might be hard to read, uh, a linear combination of vectors E1, E2 through EN, they're in the Dirac bracket, and multiplied by coefficients Z1, Z2 through ZN, complex numbers. And it is assumed that this is a unit length vector, so that means that the absolute square of Z1 plus the absolute square of Z2 plus and so on is equal to the plus the absolute square of ZN is equal to one. That's a unit vector. And um, and the E1 through EN stand for the different things that could be measured. So um, you could make up vectors of this kind in probability situations, any probability situation. You could imagine a vector of this sort where you had the faces of a die, the six faces of a die in, in a six-dimensional space with complex coefficients, and you would have a quantum dice like that. Um, here, it's an abstract number of uh, possible outcomes. And when you make a measurement on the system, when you make a measurement on this vector, it changes into only one of them, only one of the basis elements. And it does that with probability, the absolute square of the coefficient. Remember, the sum of the absolute squares of the coefficient is one. So that part is just probability, uh, but the, but the, the vector itself is consisting in those numbers whose absolute squares are the probabilities. These vectors can be added and otherwise manipulated by unitary transformations and turned into other vectors of the same kind, still of unit length. So this means that what you, uh, the picture that you have of this kind of physics from this skeleton is that a physical process takes a certain probability vector and turns it into another one by kind of rotating it. Um, and um, that's the outline of, uh, of what quantum mechanics is like. Of course, in order to find out more physics, you need to know what kind of unitary transformations are produced, and that comes from understanding the energy in the system and other aspects. But if you are someone who wishes to design an algorithm which would um, compute in a quantum mechanical way, then what you are um, being asked to do is to find a unitary transformation which has good properties and can act as a black box, and then you would apply it to some vector, and then you would measure, and you would begin to get information about your mathematical problem by measuring the way this unitary transformation behaves. So you would be using quantum mechanics to find out about some aspect, some mathematical problem or otherwise, by modeling uh, the structure of the mathematics in a unitary transformation, and that would be done in some real physical system if it's going to be a quantum computer. So I hope that gives you uh, an image of quantum mechanics that you could hold in your mind. Let's, let's look at an example or two. Um, first of all, there's the simplest kind of state vector. The simplest state vector uh, that isn't trivial is two-dimensional. And uh, we have two possibilities. You might measure this A0 plus B1 and you would measure zero or you would measure one. Uh, and zero will be returned with absolute A squared and one will be returned with absolute B squared. That's called a qubit and is the replacement for this vision of computing of the bit. 
uh, in ordinary computing, a bit is either a zero or a one, and it's definitely zero or one. There's no probability involved in theory. Uh, here, the lowest, simplest thing that you can have is a quantum state which has some probability of being zero and some probability of being one, a qubit. Um, now here is a, is a little experimental arrangement with mirrors called a, called a Mach Zender interferometer. And uh, I have two types of mirrors here, and then we can see some of the features of what I had just defined for you. Um, uh, the, the black mirror is just an ordinary mirror for this uh, these bits and qubits. If the qubit zero comes into the black mirror, it's reflected as one. If the qubit one goes into a black mirror, it's reflected as zero. And if a linear combination of zero and one were to come into the black mirror, it would be reflected with the zero turned into a one and the one turned into a zero. It is a linear transformation. And so in fact, the black mirror is the matrix M below, zero, one, one, zero. It flips the bits and it acts on linear combinations. It acts on qubits. Now the other mirror uh, is a half silvered mirror. If a bit comes in, it could be just transmitted down the straight line, or it could be reflected. And when it's reflected, it actually does flip from zero to one or from one to zero. But when it's transmitted, if it's a zero, it's transmitted normally, just, just identically. But if it's a one, it gets a phase change, turns into minus one. That means that the matrix that describes this is the matrix H that you see below. You see that if you put in zero, that's the first column, you get out equally one and zero. But if you put in one, you get in not equally zero, the top one, and minus one, the bottom one. And um, if I had had only a one, this wouldn't be uh, an invertible matrix, but with the minus one, you see that it's not only invertible, it's unitary. Uh, and so this half-silvered mirror, uh, as I have described it, is an example of a unitary quantum transformation. And, and now you see another aspect of thinking about quantum mechanics, because you can, if you wish, think about the paths of the particles as they move through the system. And in this case, uh, we're imagining that a zero gets reflected and bounces off a, a mirror at the top or, or gets transmitted and bounces off the mirror at the bottom. And then those uh, either bounce or transmit on the half-silvered mirror on the right. And if you follow the paths, all of them, all four of them, you see that two paths go upward and cancel each other out, one and minus one cancel where if you were adding up all the paths, and on the other hand, if you look at the paths on the lower part of the right, they reinforce. And so one would conclude by adding up all the contributions of all the paths, as Feynman would do in his formulation of quantum mechanics, that there should be no transmission upward from the half-silvered mirror, but you would see transmission downward uh, of a zero. And if you try it out the other way, according to the prescription that I gave you in the nutshell of composing these unitary transformations, first do H, that's the first half-silvered mirror, then do the M, then do the H, you find that indeed that's the way things work. If the zero goes in, you get a, a zero coming out. And the other part of the path calculation I didn't do, uh, but if you do that, you find that if you put a one in, then a one will come out with a phase change. So this is an example of how quantum calculations look and how you can think about them in different forms. And now let's consider something else. Let's consider what it would be like to compute the trace of a unitary matrix. Now you know how to do that if you have the matrix if you have the insides of the matrix. If you have the insides of the matrix, you take the sum over the diagonal elements and you have the trace. But that's not what you're given uh, in the quantum situation. What you're given in the quantum situation is the way the matrix acts on vectors. The matrix itself is a black box. You can give it a vector. And then furthermore, once it's acted on a vector, 
you don't get to see the vector, you only get to measure it. So you only find a, a certain small pieces of information. And then it is still possible to do a quantum algorithm to compute a trace. And this is what the quantum algorithm looks diagrammatically. You take the unitary matrix and you form a new matrix called a controlled unitary. And that's that dot and line going into the top of the unitary. And what this means is that if a zero bit is up on the top line, then that unitary will not operate. It will just be the identity. It shuts it off. But if a one goes into the top, goes into that uh, juncture at the top line, then the unitary will operate and U applied to phi will come out. H is our half silvered mirror operator, which is often called the Hadamard matrix. And that's why I called it the Hadamard test. And this, uh, the entire quantum computer here consists in a composed unitary transformation, which is H on the top tensor line, and then U on the bottom, but it's a controlled U, and then H on the top tensor line afterwards. And then you in the top tensor line and see what you get, and you look at the statistics of that. That's a mouthful. I'll show you what it is in, in specifically, but briefly, but what happens is that zero will be measured after all this with probability one half plus the real part of the inner product of phi u phi over two. And phi u phi, of course, is a diagonal element of u if phi was one of the basis elements. That's like u i i. Um, and so you're getting the real part of one of the diagonal elements of the matrix by doing a lot of observations and getting the average. And by tweaking it a little bit, you can also get the imaginary part. So you have to do many, many measurements, and then you can get the single diagonal element that you're after. And then you have to do it for each, di each basis element. And after all that work, you can get the trace. But that's an example of a quantum algorithm. They're all of that kind, a, unit, uh, a preparation applied, a unitary operation applied to it that has been constructed to do a job, and then a measurement. And notice that the unitary operation that we used was our unitary matrix that we were interested in, plus some Hadamards in order to get the thing to do what it's supposed to do. How does that happen? Well, when you look into the linear algebra, you begin to see what happened. Hadamard on zero is a combination of zero and one. Hadamard on one is a combination of zero and minus one. We were supposed to take zero tensor phi, and this is um, what you're seeing in the bottom line is Dirac notation for a tensor product. We just multiply those kets together um, and applied H to the first one. So you've got a linear combination of just good old psi and uh, U psi depending on whether it was zero or one. And, um, and then we apply H one more time on the outer line. And I know you're not going to bother to read this algebra. It would take too long to read it now. But I tell you what happens is that you then get uh, an expression whose expectation for zero is exactly what I said. So that's the way it works, a combination of linear algebra and setup and thinking about the structure of the situation, and you have a quantum algorithm. Um, the whole field uh, got a big start in, in the middle 90s when Peter Shore created a quantum algorithm more complicated than this one for uh, finding the factorization of large numbers and proved that his algorithm would run quite quickly on a quantum computer, um, which would be great for code breaking and many things of that sort. Um, another thing you can do with the algorithm that I just showed you is find an eigenvalue, because suppose that u psi was equal to lambda psi, then psi u psi, the inner product we were looking at, is just lambda. So this algorithm that we just discussed can find an eigenvalue if you're given an eigenvector. And, um, that's an important problem and has been studied uh, more carefully. And there's a, a well-known algorithm due to Alexei Kachayev called the phase estimation algorithm that does this um, 
with more bells and whistles and more accuracy than you would get out of the one I just described for you. Now, what about making quantum computers? Um, it turns out that the analog of not is what you need along with some extra material. Um, the analog of not turns out to be a controlled not. And let me jump slide forward and then come back to this slide. Um, here's a little two by two matrix. This is a controlled knot. Um, what you see is that it looks like the identity matrix in the upper quadrant, and in the lower right quadrant, it looks like a flip. And what this is, is exactly a controlled unitary uh, um, controlling, just flipping the bit. Um, if, if the first tensor uh, factor is zero, then it's the identity. If the first tensor factor is one, then it flips the second bit. And so that is a NOT gate, but it is controlled. It's just the analog of NOT that you need in a computer or a NOR gate. And you, you use that gate, that uh, a basic unitary, in combination with some, um, some elements of SU2, two by two matrices that are also unitary, like the Hadamard gate. In fact, it's one of the or a library, and you can use a couple of others. And then you have enough small gates plus this one, and then you can use linear algebra and tensor products to build everything else and build enough unitaries. So this theorem is similar to the theorem that tells you that you can build any computer out of NOR gates and some wires. You can build any quantum computer in principle out of a two qubit gate, uh, the C naught, and uh, and these special rotations, which have to occur on your wires, if you like. Uh, and then where our topology comes in, as you'll see in a moment. A gate is said to be entangling if there's some vector which is a tensor product, but when you apply the gate to it, it doesn't decompose into a tensor product. That's entanglement. And uh, there's a nice story that we could go into if we had the time about what is entanglement and how is it related to measurement and how might entanglement be related to linking and topological linking and so on. But, uh, but the Berlinskis proved a beautiful theorem that a gate, a, a two by two matrix gate is universal. That is you can substitute it for C naught and it's good enough if and only if it's entangling. So you just look for two by two matrices that are unitary and entangling. And sometimes they're also topological. Um, here's an example. This is called the Bell basis change matrix. Uh, it, it's very entangling. It takes the standard basis of four dimensional space, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. It takes them over to each one to an entangled state. Those guys on the right are just not tensor products. There's an easy criterion in four space for finding out whether something is entangled. I've written it there. You might find it interesting to look at. It's certainly a digression. Uh, but you see that you have coefficients A, B, C, D, and they could be regarded as the entries of a four by four matrix whose entries are in the zero, zero place A and the zero, one place B and so on. And then you need that the determinant of that is non-zero and then the gate will be entangling. So this is very entangling, but it also turns out to be a solution to the Yang-Baxter equation. The Yang-Baxter equation is where we contact topology for the first time here. Um, the Yang-Baxter equation is the braiding equation written in tensor language. Let's look at how that uh, goes. Here's the braiding, basic braiding equation that you would have a bit of braiding on two lines, a bit of braiding on, the, on lines two and three, and a bit of braiding on lines one and two again. And uh, it, it has the form of a Reitermeister three move. The overcrossing line can be shifted downward. The crossing underneath can be shifted upward. And you've got another braiding, which is second two lines, first two lines. And if we translate this into tensor language and call R the crossing, 
then we are looking at R tensor 1, then 1 tensor R, then R tensor 1 on the left hand side, and 1 tensor R, R tensor 1, 1 tensor R on the right hand side, and so this composition, the equation, and you know that you've entered into something topological if you had a, uh, a matrix which satisfied this equation. Matrices which satisfy this equation can be used to make knot invariants, and they can be used to make representations of the braid group. So here we're looking at a unitary matrix, that one, uh, which also satisfies the Yang-Baxter equation, and it can be replaced for universal quantum computing if you want to. You can use that one. So you wonder, well, maybe there's some physical situation that actually involves braiding that could be in back of, uh, of this uh, Bell basis matrix. And there are others, there are others. Um, here's a couple of examples, uh, all the way down to the one at the bottom, which is a, a very similar to C naught, but it's got a little phase change in it. Um, and um, it also satisfies the Yang-Baxter equation. The Bell basis one is strong enough to actually model a little bit of the Homfle polynomial, and you can prove that the Borromian rings are linked by using it. It, it actually is, um, it actually has some topology in it. So, uh, so if you just had a gate that satisfied the Yang-Baxter equation, but you still needed those local unitaries that I showed you, do you remember? I'm going to flip slides back. It's not enough to just have that wonderful gate. You also need these little rotations that are happening in the qubit uh, domain. You need to be exactly topological. You don't know. So, um, so if you only have a good topological gate G, like I showed you, um, uh, that might not be enough to really get it to be fully topological. It would only be partial topological. And it's a research problem to understand how well partial topological computers might uh, work. Are they going to be helpful even though they aren't entirely topological? The intuition is that one that was completely topological would be better. And a scheme for making such uh, comes from thinking about the quantum Hall effect. Now, I know I'm supposed to open to questions at the half hour point, but if you don't mind, I will continue through part of the quantum Hall effect and then open to questions. Um, so the quantum Hall effect is a very interesting physical uh, situation, which doesn't require a lot of equipment, but it's quite subtle. You have a metal plate, and you're probably going to have it in a very cooled environment. Um, and it has a current running across it um, transversely from left to right, constant current. And it's in a magnetic field. And you measure the uh, current, uh, you measure the resistance or conductance of the plate transverse to the current that runs through it. And it turns out that this is quantized as a function of the current that's running across, and even subtly quantized. And the intuition about this is, the modeling of this, is that the electrons go into vortices around the magnetic field lines and form collectivities of electrons that are vortexing around the field lines. And these collectivities can be themselves thought of as particles, and that in the theory of this, which involves Chern-Simons theory, if you figure out what happens to one of these vortices as it moves around another one, there's a phase change in the system, which is not just plus or minus one, some angular phase change, e to the i theta. And, uh, and with regard to that, some representation of the braid group occurring if you could measure this kind of phase change that occurs. Um, at the present time, no one has measured the phase changes in an effective way, and, and it, it is probable that they will be measured in an indirect way eventually. And if they could be measured and controlled, uh, 
then one could imagine building a quantum computer based on braiding that had as its basis what happens in the quantum Hall effect. So what I'm going to talk about is the structure of those kind of braiding representations. And so we're going to be thinking of anions, which are these collective particles, particles that move around one another. And if they did move around one another, as you see in this slide, then some braiding would occur. And I've also indicated the method by which I'm going to imagine measuring the braiding as a strictly theoretical method, which is the particles interact and you see a little line, a little Y, and uh, another particle comes out. And you imagine that you can find out what particle came out, and you would know the quantum amplitude, the quantum complex probability for that happening. And that would be, the, that would be related to a phase, and lambda would be that phase. So you would, have, um, you would have a phase measurement corresponding to two local particles. But if you had three, and you wanted to formulate, formulate how the braiding would work, then you can think of braiding the first two and then braiding the product of them, how they interacted, with the third, and then seeing what came out. So in this way of doing theory for it, you think about particle interaction, then the output of that interacts with another particle and you get something. But that means that if you use that framework, first to interact and then interact with the third, and you wanted to know how the second two were interacting, it would be obscure. Um, on the other hand, if you use the tree of interactions on the right-hand side in this picture, you could figure out how the second two interacted. So the tree of interactions corresponds to a vector space, the different kinds of outcomes that can happen. So that tree, actually corresponds to a vector space, and one can write a basis change, F, from one vector space to the other, and thereby compare how the braiding works in between different particles. It's going to look like this. I want to braid the first two, but I'm in the first framework where they aren't next to one another. So I change basis, F. Now I know I can apply R. Now I change basis back, and I find that I have an expression for the braiding of the second two in terms of the first framework. And it is given by F inverse RF. R was some diagonal matrix, it was just phases, but F inverse RF is not diagonal, it's a more complicated matrix. And that's how you will end up with non-abelian braid group representations from a scheme like this. At this point, I'm going to stop for a moment and open this up to questions. Okay, good. Any question, please? <clears throat> well, maybe I should go on then. I have a question, actually. Actually, Good. maybe two, two comments. One, you mentioned partial topological, and they wanted to understand better the difference between what you meant, of course, by partial and, and full topological. And the second is also a quick comment on, uh, on the phase. Can the phase lambda have any real value? No integer, but real values. Well, in... The, the classical situation is what happens when you have an electron and you walk around an electron and come back to where you started, um, or, or you exchange two electrons, and then the phase is minus one. So that's real and non-trivial. So the simplest example of, of this kind of phase change is multiplication by minus one. Uh, but uh, but in the in these cases uh, you might be multiplying by e to the e to the two pi i over five or something like that, and you have more complex grade group representations as a result. The first part of your question, 
was uh, what what is this distinction between purely topological quantum computer and partial topological quantum computer? Um, the idea of a purely topological one, an entirely topological one, would be that every gate would be uh, a braiding element. Every gate would be coming from braiding. Um, in the example that I first gave, the, the nice replacement for the knot gate, the C knot replacement, uh, could be a solution to Yang Baxter. So it's a braiding operator. But the other operators that are needed, the local ones, are not uh, braiding operators. In the scheme I'm about to show you, I'm going to show you how it's possible to have every operator that you use coming from the braiding representation. And why would you want that? Well, in, in principle, you would want that because you would say that means that every one of those operators could be perturbed a little bit and it wouldn't matter. And perturbation, I didn't talk about it very much, but the problem is, of course, that anything you do is a, is a measurement, really. Um, if you look at something, you're measuring it. If you, if, you if you do something to the system, you're basically measuring it. And you don't want to measure anything until you do it the way you want to measure. I, when I indicated that algorithm way back, I said, well, we'll let this happen and then we'll measure. If something happened in between, everything changes. Um, there's a famous um, uh, image that's used in teaching quantum mechanics, uh, the double slit experiment. And everyone probably knows the story that if you leave the slits unattended and unobserved, then you get interference at the screen in the double slit experiment. But if any, if any measurement device is placed near one of the slits, then the interference pattern uh, disappears and you get something else. So this is the, exactly the problem of quantum computing. If there was any measurement in between the preparation and the detection that you had in mind, everything would be changed. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be doing what you wanted. Does that okay, answer the, begin to answer the question? Very well. Thank you very much. You may continue. Okay, I'll continue. Um, so you see, we have these trees, and you could have lots. You could have big, big ones, right? Here, I, I'm imagining I have a, a, a row of um, of seven particles, and uh, in my scheme here, the first two interact. Then I look at the interaction with the next one, the interaction with the next one, and so on. And there are many, many. Uh, uh, dimensions to the vector space associated with this tree, lots of possibilities. Um, now the simplest uh, imaginable process that you could think of is a particle which interacts with itself to produce itself, or it annihilates itself, star being just a, a neutral state. And we'll call that for now a Fibonacci particle. and um, and that turns out to be one of the possibilities for the way that these quasi-particles can interact in Quantum Hall. But this is as simple as it could be, and so it's nice to think about mathematically. And um, here's a little tree for that particle. It interacts with itself and produces star, and then star, being neutral, interacts with P to produce P. Uh, that's one, pump, one, state, one thing that could happen. Or it interacts with itself to produce P, and then P interacts with itself to produce P. Now, another thing that can happen is that P interacts with itself to produce star. But suppose we restrict it to just this subspace. Then there would be exactly two things that could happen. And so this could be a qubit space, just this set of interactions. And, and then we could examine how uh, braiding would operate on this two qubit space, on this single qubit space, excuse me. Uh, and braiding can happen by braiding the lines above, because remember these three points stand for three particles sitting in a plane, and they could go around one another and braid. So this is how we could have local unitary transformations that are still braiding. You could have two by two matrices that represent braiding of three things. Now, I'm going to skip this slide that says food for thought. There's lots of food for thought. And 
This is a reference to where you can read about this formalism of spin networks. And I'll just go past it. And we want to think about some more topology here. So I'm going to introduce a bit more topology into the brew. Um, there is the subject of knots, links, and braids. Uh, the fact that you can close braids to get various knots. And Alexander's wonderful theorem that says that any knot or link can be the closure of a braid. And the Rademeister moves that can express isotopy of knots and links. And the fact, of course, that knot diagrams can occur in scientific situations, such as electron micrographs of DNA. Um, and the Jones polynomial in the bracket model turns out to be the technology that we're going to use. I said at the beginning that with churn simons theory, it is. But um, if you're a combinatorial topologist and you want to look at these braid group representations, you can use the Jones polynomial in bracket form, and you get uh, a direct entry into the braiding representations that we're going to talk about. And it goes like this. Uh, the technology is a little complicated. Um, you, um, you need to use uh, not invariance with the bracket, but you need to use multiple lines. So uh, the part of the slide to look at is the upper right, where you see a box with a two, and that means two lines. And then the box with two lines really means two, ver two lines vertical minus one over the value of the loop times a turnaround. Um, you could do a knot invariant involving two lines by replacing every, every curve in your knot by a doubled line, and then expanding all the lines by these kind of projectors, uh, Jones-Wenzel projectors, and you would get an invariant of knots. And it turns out that the projectors are uh, important because they simplify a lot of the algebra, and they're related to algebra that we aren't talking about here. And you can do n-fold uh, projectors as well, and they correspond to adding up over all permutations. But then, for the sake of topology, permutations are lifted to crossings. Crossings in, in a diagram of a permutation are lifted to weaving, and um, and then you evaluate according to the bracket, and you get these n-fold projectors. And then the interaction of particle A with particle B, lower right-hand part of the slide, to produce particle C, turns out to be modeled by sticking projectors together that fit together in the right way. Um, and that's the technology of, of, of deformed spin networks and colored Jones polynomial and braiding that is in back of doing these representations. Um, I neglected in this slide to show you what happens with two. With two, the just two lines, and you try to fit the boxes together as you come on the bottom right-hand corner, well, it would look like that if you thought that you had two lines coming in, A is two, B is two, and I, J, and K were single lines, then it would fit together just fine, right? Two going out of A, two going out of B, one connects back to B, and the other two go down to C. So C could be another example of a two. So a two can interact with a two to produce a two. And a two can also interact with a two to produce nothing by just connecting both lines backward. Um, and I neglected to put in a, a good slide for that. But the point is that when you use two, you end up with a mathematical particle, which has exactly the right properties as the P that we were looking for. And so by using uh, two-fold cabling nets, um, you can produce models for quantum computing, and that's called the Fibonacci model. These models uh, uh, satisfy all sorts of nice identities, uh, interrelating braiding and the uh, interaction vertices that you're looking at in this slide. Sometimes people, for the sake of building these kinds of theories and for the sake of topological quantum field theory, take properties like the ones you're looking at on this slide as axioms. And then, for example, 
the fact that R will satisfy the braiding equation is a consequence of things like this. Oh, here we are. This is the slide I was describing to you. I did have it. Over on the right-hand side, you see a 2 interacting with a 2 to produce um, a, a 2. And you also see a 2 interacting with a 2 just backing right up and producing nothing. So uh, if we set the parameters so that a 4 doesn't come in, it gets equal to 0. And that's why you have to work at a certain root of unity. Why then you have exactly a theory of this very elementary particle, which only interacts with itself to produce itself or nothing. And that one can then be used to produce braiding by working out the change of basis that I told you about before. And the change of basis turns out to be a little two by two matrix like the one on the slide. Um, the value of the loop turns out to be, uh, uh, beautifully enough, the golden ratio. Um, and uh, the diagonal phase matrix turns out to be the things you see in this slide. So the braiding, the three strand braiding, that is in back of everything here, is a little diagonal uh, braiding for the first two strands, and then the F inverse RF, uh, which I didn't write down, for the second two strands, and you get a three strand braid group. But then this can be orchestrated in larger trees and producing higher uh, representation. This is called is uh, given by the representation of braids, and corresponds in principle to the way the anions move around in uh, something like quantum Hall. Um, I'm going to skip this technology, but but I'll let you see it a little bit. There's a technology for calculating with these interaction vertices called recoupling theory, and you can do it. Uh, for any number of lines, and you get formulas like these and certain kinds of coefficients called 6J coefficients, the ones with six numbers in them, and evaluations of certain basic nets, things in the shape of tetrahedra or thetas. Um, and with the help of that and a little reworking of things, you get generalizations of everything I've said that let you do a theory for um, other particle interactions, and um, and these changes of basis are unitary, and this is important because those are the general changes of basis, and so you get unitary representations of the break group um, for other roots of unity, and you can do lots of quantum computing in principle by using these. The Fibonacci model itself is is universal, and if you wanted to use it to compute non-invariance, then it's um, it's fitted for that. You start with a braid. You want to find the, say, the value of the closure of the braid, where I've used a flat closure there, um, and you put it into the context of the trees, and you work things out and calculate, and you can actually find the colored Jones polynomials in that way. And then you would use the Hadamard test to find the information that you wanted. So if we ever get good quantum computers, we'll have lots of new ways to calculate non-invariance. Um, we don't know if these models will actually be used in this way, certainly, because it hasn't yet been uh, the research that would, would show uh, how to detect the phases in the quantum Hall systems has not yet happened. It will surely be a Nobel Prize for someone. So that's part one, and we're almost out of time. Um, if you would give me a few more minutes, I'll tell you about the other braiding representation that's dear to my heart. Sure. And this one, this one um, has to do with the vision of uh, a physicist named Ettore Majorana, who 
had the idea that there should be particles that are their own antiparticles. Now, you'll remember that the particle I was talking about, the Fibonacci particle, is its own antiparticle. Uh, and um, Majorana had the idea that maybe the, the, maybe the neutron was its own antiparticle or the neutrino. And, um, uh, and then more recently, people began to realize that electrons could be thought of as composed of Majorana fermions, of composed of particles that are their own antiparticles. I want to show you how that works and how we get braiding there. This is simpler than what I talked about before. This is just our picture of a particle interacting with itself to produce itself or nothing. And I can't resist mentioning a logical particle that does this. This is a formalism for logic where you have a bracket due to George Spencer Brown. And if the bracket is inside itself, it, it cancels, like double negation. But if it's next to itself, it condenses and so becomes itself. So this is a logical particle, a formalism that acts like that. Um, now, in order to discuss this, I need an elementary Clifford algebra. I need an algebra where the squares of the elements in the algebra are one and they anti-commute. All right? So that's a nice bit of algebra. Um, and here's the reason why. When you talk about ordinary fermions, they have creation and annihilation operators. And you may vaguely remember such things from a physics course, or you may be intimately familiar with it. I don't know. But let's just write down what, uh, what the rules are here. The rules for fermions are that the product of the creation operator with itself or the annihilation operator with itself is equal to zero. That's like the Pauli exclusion principle saying that two fermions can't be in the same place. But then there's an anti-commutator, the sum of f, f star and f star f equal to 1. Um, and you could wonder, well, how could that happen? Um, uh, but uh, it can happen this way mathematically. Suppose I defined a u to be equal to a plus i b and a u star to be a minus i b, and a star is a and b star is b. That's our Clifford algebra. And we assume that it anti-commutes, and they each square to 1. And we do a little elementary algebra. We take u times u. And you see, I get a squared minus b squared. That's 0. And I get a b plus b a, and that's 0. So u squared is 0, and u star squared is 0. And if you take u, u star plus u star u, you find that you get 4. So I, I wasn't using the right constant here, but you get the fermion relation. This says that an electron in its formalism, in the mathematical formalism, could be thought of as two Majorana fermions, A and B, uh, in the sense of representing them as Clifford algebra elements, combined together in a form A plus IB, so that it would have an antiparticle A minus IB. like a mathematical fantasy, but people actually have done experiments recently to uh, figure out what kind of correlation there would be in a row of, uh, of electrons if you thought that they were Majorana fermions, so it would be a special correlation between the ends. And it's possible to have rows of electrons in very tiny wires and nanowires and to find the correlations, and they bear out this model. And so people have the idea, and this goes back to work of Kitayev also uh, early on, but the, the experiments are more recent, around 2012. And so people have the idea that maybe you could think of computing with rows of, uh, of these Majorana fermions. Um, and uh, there was an interesting paper by Ivanov a long time ago about how they braid. And, um, and so this is, um, this is a, a research topic now, uh, and there are people who are writing papers about designing computers based on Majorana fermions. They would be partial, um, and uh, it's probably as hard to, rep to examine the braiding of the Majorana fermions as it is to do the quantum Hall effect, uh, so this is still research. But here's the braiding, here's the braiding, uh, written as a theorem. 
by me this way. Um, I take a bunch of Majoranas, that is, I take a Clifford algebra generated by C1 through Cn with the squares are equal to 1, and they all anti-commute with one another. And you've defined this improbable looking operator, 1 plus Ck plus 1 Ck over root 2. And you find that those braid. They braid. Um, Ck plus 1 Ck squared is minus 1 because of the way this algebra works. And so it looks like 1 plus i over root 2. It looks like an eighth root of unity. Um, and, um, and so you get a very interesting little braid group representation out of this. And that's the one that I find quite fascinating to think about. So Clifford algebras give rise to representations of the braid group. What's going on with this is that it's a generalization of quaternions. If you started with a Clifford algebra on three generators, A, B, and C, uh, you can form the quaternions. This is cute. You should teach this to grade school children um, in the spirit of Ken Perko, who wants to teach not theory to fifth graders. Um, I'm not sure, seventh grade maybe? Um, we let I be B, A, J, B, C, B, and K, B, A, C. Those are those products I was telling you about. And then you find I squared, J squared, and K squared are minus one, but so is I, J, K. You got the quaternions out of this. And, and then if you form these quaternion operators, A, B, and C that I wrote down, they braid. Uh, and that's really the pattern. It's coming out of the quaternions and the Clifford algebra, the lines of many Clifford algebra generators are certain kinds of generalizations of quaternions. There are postage stamp ways of checking the braiding in this sense. You start with two things whose so square is minus one and add I commute and you take two operators, one plus A and one plus B, and you find that they braid. Um, lots of nice, uh, small non-commutative algebra exercises. But Ivanov did something very interesting. It's at the bottom of the slide. He said, we'll take those operators and we'll conjugate the, the algebra elements themselves. So he thinks of the particles as represented by the very algebra elements, C1 through Cn, and then we'll conjugate one by another and get a braiding representation It's simple. When you look at what happens to two of them that braid, they uh, one of them gets a minus sign. Uh, when you look at two that are far apart, they don't um, they don't braid in his representation. Um, so it's a very simple braiding representation. You can write matrices for it, and you can grab gates out of it, and they're universal because of that minus sign, just like before. A little extra phase is good enough, but it also is showing you the coincidence of this with the belt trick, because if you had a belt between the two particles and you switch them, the belt gets a 360 degree twist, which should be thought of as minus one. And, and it doesn't just get a 360 degree twist somewhere, it gets it on one of them, but not on the other, because this has been set up in an algebraic context. And that makes all the difference for making the op belt trick, which is coming out of the fundamental physics of the electrons, and 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 uh, that's the braiding representation that might also produce quantum computing, and is very interesting in its own right. If there's still a little more time, I would entertain you with a movie. Shall I? Okay, go ahead. It's How long two will minute, be the movie? Uh, this is a two-minute two movie that we made a long time ago. Let me get the sound okay. off it so I can talk. We made this movie to illustrate the belt trick. And so I can comment on some things that we've seen as we look at the movie. You're looking at a, 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 a sphere and a, a little sphere inside it. And they're, um, the, they're both stationary, but the belts are allowed to move. They're anchored to the upper, outer sphere and the inner sphere. And you see that uh, you can go around and around the inner one, and the belt just twists and untwists. Every time it goes around once, it's twisted. When it goes around twice, it's untwisted again. Um, this corresponds to the phase change of minus one for a fermion. Um, and all this is happening by direct topological connection in space. 
uh, when we used the quantum theory model, we had unitary transformations that represented everything. And, uh, and ordinary space doesn't contain those unitary transformations. That is to say, symmetries in ordinary space are rotational. And the quaternions, or the SU2, actually, as you probably know, double cover the rotation group in three-dimensional space. So by, um, by separating the symmetry groups from the space the way we usually do, we get a story about what happens with the phases. But it is amazing that in actual space, by adding topological bands, all this happens in the space. You can represent the quaternions by rotations of an object with a band attached to it. And, um, and you see all this happening in a very condensed way, this way. And you might wonder whether these um, uh, pictures that I've been showing you earlier of, of braiding representations that are more complex could also have a, a belt trick associated with them, a, 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 a nexus in three-dimensional space of geometry that would explain everything. I would like to see that. I find the, uh, the abstract point of view um, uh, logically very beautiful, but uh, somehow there's more geometry here than meets the eye in, the, in this algebraic approach. And maybe we'll see that as we keep thinking. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lou. Wonderful talk.